Welcome to Chapter 3, Legal Issues Lecture. In this chapter, we're going to discuss um, the legal issues that could be brought up in healthcare, medical law, and how it impacts you as a medical assistant. So the definition of law is a system of rules usually enforced through a collection of institutions commonly recognized as having the authority to do so. Some examples of such would be um, the court systems, the police officers, um, even the representatives from a hospital or medical facility, somebody that imposes the rules and enforces the rules and makes it so that everyone follows them and understands them. <clears throat> so again, the definition of law is a system of rules usually enforced through a collection of institutions commonly recognized as having the authority to do so. We will discuss this some more in the next slides to come. So U.S. Congress makes federal law. It is applicable to all per the supremacy clause of the Constitution. This means that everyone is impacted by federal law. State legislatures make state law. This is applicable to those who live in that. So for instance, if you live in Ohio, you are um, impacted by Ohio state law. If you live in Texas, you're impacted by Texas state law, et cetera, et cetera. But we're all impacted by federal law. And then local governments make resolutions or ordinances that you have to follow. For example, um, if you live in Plymouth, whatever their noise ordinance, typically it's 11 o'clock. Um, that means after 11 o'clock, you can't have loud noise. That is an example of an ordinance um, imparted by a local government. Um, so the U.S. Supreme Court makes law because they interpret the Constitution. So the Constitution was written, and then they take that information and they implement it into um, <clears throat> how they're going to perceive the law and how we as citizens have to follow the law. An example would be the court case Roe versus Wade. Um, this is something that I encourage you to look up on your own time. I feel like you might find this interesting, and it gives you a really good um, look at how the Constitution is used to make law. Common law, also known as case law, is the law of precedent. It is a term that comes from um, handling situations not covered by a statute. <clears throat> Types of liability. Um, this is interesting. It kind of shifts gears here. So I encourage you to read through this section of your textbook. But just to give you an idea, um, there is insurance that is for liability, and it protects physicians or medical professionals against malpractice suits or claims. Um, malpractice literally is defined as bad practice. Mal itself is a word part and it refers to bad. That's what it means. And then practice, of course, means practice. So you put the two together and it becomes malpractice, which means um, that the physician or medical professional did not do something they were supposed to do or they did something they weren't supposed to do. So it's defined as any medical treatment that falls short of normal levels of skill, care, or established medical procedure. Um, so personal injury liability insurance is designed to protect the policyholder from lawsuits filed because of alleged damage to an individual resulting from the invasion of privacy. This includes damage to someone's character. An example of an invasion of someone's privacy is um, you are a physician and you know that Sally has, um, Sally has a chronic disease that really is going to impact her ability to do what she needs to do for her career as an actress. So you leak it to TMZ that she has this disease. That is a defamation of character. That's damaging someone's character. And that also is um, is a HIPAA violation, which all falls under liability, personal injury liability insurance um, pr to protect the, the physician who leaked that information from the lawsuits that are going to come from that. In healthcare, another example of personal injury is when a patient's personal medical information is released to the public. Again, so this doctor released Sally's information to TMZ. TMZ puts it on the news. That is um, that is a personal injury resulting from the, the release of somebody's personal medical information. <clears throat> Here's where we really need to get into and we really need to pay attention. So criminal versus civil law. In healthcare, both apply. Um, that's why we bring it up. But criminal law deals with one person who has performed an act prohibited by law or failed to perform an act that is required by law. Um, we will get into examples as time goes on, but be aware that the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt for criminal law. Civil law is a collection of rules that govern the conduct and affairs of people, their rights that are not a crime. 
Um, the standard of proof is preponderance of evidence. Um, misdemeanors are crimes punishable by less than one year in a jail, most commonly a county or regional jail, not a state and prison. Um, sometimes the punishment could include a fine or the fine may be imposed. This is a this is a type of criminal law. So if somebody violates a commits a crime, a misdemeanor could be the type of crime that they've committed. Felonies are another type of crime, crimes that are committed by people who intended to do something significantly to harm someone else, um, either by depriving them of their property or injuring, injuring them personally. And then there's murder. Murder is the unlawful killing of another with malice aforethought. Um, so that basically means that they killed somebody without thinking it through, like they didn't plan it out. So this could be um, like a crime of passion or an accidental crime or an accidental um, killing of someone, but it wasn't premeditated. Legislatures have defined a number of degrees of murder based on the level of premeditation by the definition, um, or I'm sorry, by the defendant or the status of the victim. So basically, as we move forward, we'll talk about the different statutes and like the different levels of murder based on premeditation. <clears throat> so here's manslaughter. Manslaughter is when you, um, you kill somebody without malice, so like you didn't mean to. Um, a popular term to help kind of remember this is vehicular manslaughter. So vehicular manslaughter, say somebody comes out in front of you in the street, you hit them and they, they pass away as a result of the injuries sustained from that. Um, you didn't do it on purpose. You weren't seeking out to hit them. So therefore it's unlawful, but um, there's no malice. You didn't do it to hurt them on purpose. It was an accident. Voluntary um, is upon a sudden quarrel or heat of passion. So Voluntary manslaughter is when you somebody dies as a result of a fight that breaks out. It was not intended or, um, like I said, a crime of passion where there was no premeditation. Um, the person is murdered and um, it, it wasn't something you came there to do or the person came there to do. It just happened. Involuntary is the commission of an unlawful act or without due caution and circumspection. So like. Um, it's an, it's when you go to do something else and then somebody ends up dying as a result of what you were doing, but that's not what you intended to have done. Uh, types of other crimes. So in healthcare, these are, these are really different, but for the sake of law in general, robbery is the unlawful taking of money or goods from another person, um, in the immediate presence by force or intimidation. So I always use the example of you go to the gas station, well, not you, but somebody goes to the gas station points a gun at the clerk, the clerk puts their hands up and they say, give me all your money. That's robbery. Um, the person's there, you're threatening them saying, give me the money. That's robbery. Burglary is like robbery, but the difference is that there's no person there. So this would be like, you go in after the gas station closes, you take the money from the drawer or the safe or what have you, but there's no person there that you're holding at gunpoint. Does that make sense? Like it's kind of um, it's, so robbery is where there's somebody involved and then burglary is where it's just the person committing the crime itself. <clears throat> so this is where healthcare really gets kind of confusing in terms of law and ethics. So tort, um, torts are, they come from the Latin word tortum, which means wrong. A tort can be intentional or unintentional. And we'll see how this impacts healthcare as we move through these slides. So intentional torts are libel and slander, which are defamation of character. So this is where, like we said, we sent that diagnosis to TMZ and Sally lost her job because the, now the world knows that she has this disease. That is a defamation of character. Other intentional tort would be trespassing. Um, you go onto somebody's property that you're not supposed to be on. <clears throat> that is a crime. It is a tort specifically um, trespassing. An intentional infliction of emotional distress is another intentional tort. And then medical malpractice. So medical malpractice, as we had learned on the slide here prior, let me go back to that slide, um, <clears throat> is defined as simply medical treatment that falls short of normal levels of skill, care, or established medical practice. An example of this would be um, you go in for surgery, the surgeon, they don't do their supply count before and after surgery, and then they leave a sponge inside of your chest cavity and you get an infection and it causes you pain, suffering, or death, that is medical malpractice. Unintentional torts are accidental things, things that you don't do on purpose, um, but they happen and they cause somebody harm. 
Um, negligence is another one of these things. Uh, we'll talk about this more as we get into it, but negligence is definitely something that people in healthcare, I think, have to be really conscious of because like, as you can see here, it happens unintentionally, um, but it can be very damaging. So negligence is the unintentional act most often concerns medical professionals. The central point is it happens by mistake or by accident. Uh, for instance, you have a patient in room three. They um, just had surgery. They're a fall risk, but you forgot to put the fall bracelet on their wrist and you forgot to note it in the chart that they were a fall risk and you didn't put the bedside rails up. It wasn't because you don't care about that person or because you weren't trying to do your job. It's because you forgot you're busy. It happens. Um, but that patient falls out of bed and breaks their hip, and now they have to have another surgery while they're here recovering from their first surgery. Um, that's negligence. It's not planned or contrived in any way, and the underlying principle that establishes whether a plaintiff can collect for damages is standard of care. The defendant owed the plaintiff. So you as the defendant in this healthcare situation would be the one that neglected to put the rails up and neglected to document the fall risk. Um, and the patient is the plaintiff, the one who suffered, the one who's suing to collect for damages. So it's um, it has to be proven that there was the standard of care and that you as a medical professional did not meet that standard of care. So here's the four factors of negligence that are really critical. As a medical professional and as a medical assisting student, you need to understand these and you need to know how they affect you. So there must be a duty of care owed by the defendant to the plaintiff. I'm sorry, the defendant to the plaintiff. That's the responsibility that you as a medical professional owe them. There must be a breach of that duty by the defendant to count as negligence. So you have this responsibility. Let's give an example again. So you have this responsibility to document that this patient's a fall risk and to put the side rails up. You didn't do one of those two things. The patient fell. That's their harm or injury in this situation, which is the next piece. So the plaintiff suffers injury because you didn't do the first thing. And that harm can be resulting of the defendant's breach of duty, which is causation. So you have a duty of care. You didn't complete your responsibilities, so that's a breach. The patient suffered injury, um, and then it all happened because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So duty of, um, duty of care, breach of that duty, injury, and then causation. Those are four, four terms that need to be stuck in your brain because those are very, very important when it comes to healthcare in general. So there are six factors of medical malpractice. So we just finished talking about negligence. Now we're going to switch back to medical malpractice, which we learned from before. Malpractice is literally translated to bad practice. The six factors of medical malpractice are such. There is a relationship between the provider and the patient. That relationship created a duty on the part of the provider. Okay, so the relationship created a duty on the part of the provider toward the patient, as I was just saying. And then the duty was of the nature of a professional standard of care. So every physician, when they enter healthcare and they become a physician and they start taking care of patients, they wage relationships between themselves and the patient. And that relationship states, I am going to provide you with this level of care. That is my standard of care. I am responsible to give that to you. That relationship creates that duty, and that duty is based on the nature of the standard of care of the physician. So if, you, if you're in a, a, a a contractual relationship with a physician where they say, I'm going to provide you with this medication, this visit, this level of care, then they're legally obligated to uphold that. If they don't, then that becomes medical malpractice. Um, so the provider breaches the duty to the patient. The patient had a resulting injury, and then the patient would not have sustained that injury, but for the provider's breach of duty, which is causation. So we're going to go back to this slide, and we're going to talk about the relationship again. So you have relationship and then you have a relationship created a duty. Number three is the standard of care. Number four is the breach of that duty. Number five is the injury resulting. And number six is the causation. So it's similar to the four factors of negligence, but in this case, there are some extra steps. Um, so the six factors, again, of medical malpractice are relationship between the provider and the patient. You have to have a relationship established. That's number one. Number two, that relationship created a duty on part of the provider toward the patient. So the physician owes you the duty of care or the duty was of the nature of a professional standard of care, meaning it had to be to a certain degree. The provider didn't do what they were supposed to do. They breached that duty. That's number four the, or number five. The patient, no, number four, the patient was, um, then in turn injured because of that breach of duty. 
And then the patient would not have been injured had it not been for that breach of duty, which is causation, which is number six. So those are the six factors of medical malpractice. Um, to, in the situation that a provider is guilty of medical malpractice, there are defenses to or to like argue their claim, which would be the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations is how much time lapses in between the incident itself and the time that the, the, the plaintiff is seeking to sue for damages to the defendant. Contributory negligence means that both parties were involved in creating the negligence. So an example to kind of explain this would be you have a physician um, who writes you a prescription. That's their responsibility. They've met their duty of care, but maybe it was the wrong prescription, but you didn't take it anyways. So then you're both kind of negligent for not getting the treatment you were supposed to be because you're supposed to be getting because doc wrote the wrong script. Patient didn't even take it to begin with because they didn't they didn't take the medication as prescribed. And that becomes contributory negligence. So basically, contributory negligence, again, is just when both people, plaintiff and defendant, have some responsibility towards whatever happened. And then there's emergencies. So if a physician assists you in an emergency situation, the rules are different. That could be one of the defenses to medical malpractice. Um, this is something that I don't care to explain really in depth because I feel like it gets really confusing and really messy. But just to give you a brief example, if you're on an airplane and uh, you're the passenger next to you is having a heart attack and there's a physician the third row down and he saves the, the patient's life on the airplane... Okay, so now let's talk about contracts. Contracts are a definitive piece of healthcare, and I think they're very important to understand. You, you know, you go to buy a car or buy a house, and there's a contract there, but there's also you also enter into a contract when you when you become a patient of a physician. And I, I don't think people realize that that's actually a legal legally binding contract. So here's what's happening: when you become a patient of a doctor, that doctor now in contract says, I'm going to give you this level of care, their standard of care. That is my responsibility to you. Um, and I will make sure to meet those expectations. Okay. <clears throat> so to have that contract, there has to be three pieces. So there's an offer, there's a consideration, and then there's an acceptance. We will talk about those more. And as we get through, um, as we get through this chapter and learn more about the doctor patient contract. Um, but basically the provider by holding themselves out to provide medical services is making an offer to care for the patient. When the patient makes an appointment, that patient is indicating acceptance of that offer. And when that patient assures the MA is taking the appointment that she has or he has insurance and will pay the copay, that's consideration. So those are how the three pieces look inside of a medical like doctor contract. Okay. This information's all on page 47 in your textbook if you want to read more about it. But you do absolutely need to remember that the elements of a valid contract are offer, consideration, acceptance. You have to have all three pieces to have a contract in any shape or form, not just the doctor patient contract. So there are different types of contracts there's expressed and then there's implied. This is kind of, um, this is really important, but it's, this kind of gets messy. So bear with me. So an express contract is where a patient directly communicates consent to the doctor. An example of this would be Susie Smith is going to have surgery on Tuesday. On Monday, she goes to see Dr. Thomas. He gives her a consent form where he explains in layman terms that she's going to have a scope of her esophagus and down into her stomach. And it is to see if she has Barrett's esophagus. He explains it in layman's terms so she understands it. She signs the consent form, having been notified that the risks are blah, 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 whatever the risks are, death. I mean, I don't know. Um, she expresses to that physician, yes, I give you consent to do this procedure on this day at this time, despite the risks of the procedure. That is an expressed contract. An implied contract is very different. So in healthcare, doctors or medical assistants or whomever may rely on implied consent only in the absence of consent. So an example of this would be you're a medical assistant and your patient comes into the office to have their weekly blood drawn. Instead of saying, I give you my permission to draw my blood, they put their arm out for you, opening their arm so that you can reach their antecubital space to perform the procedure. That therein is, is an implied consent. 
Um, <clears throat> it can never overrule the explicit rejection of medical care, though. So even if their arm is out and they tell you, no, 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 I don't want you to draw my blood, don't draw my blood, don't draw my blood, but their arm is out, you cannot, <clears throat> you cannot overrule them and still draw their blood, even though they're giving you implied consent, but they're expressing that they do not want the procedure done. <clears throat> this gets tricky with children because um, when you're trying to draw blood of the blood of a child, usually it is, um, <clears throat> they get really nervous. So they're screaming, no, but like mom's holding their arm out. In that situation, the parent has the right to consent, not the child. So it would be, you would still be able to perform the procedure, even though the child is telling you no. So the rights of the parties to the contract. So basically, <clears throat> in most cases involving healthcare providers, contracts are oral agreements and thus subject to both statutory and common law interpretations. As a medical assistant, you're required to understand the provider's obligation to the patient also and the rights of the provider in the doctor-patient relationship. So like any other contract, the people who make a contract have certain rights in business. Many of these rights will have been spelled out in the contract document. And in most cases involving healthcare providers, the contracts are oral agreements like we just talked about, but they're both subject to statutory and common law interpretations. Um, remember, you're the doctor's agent. So as a medical assistant, you're acting um, in the best interest of that physician as well. And you have responsibilities not only to the patient, but to the provider. These are mutual rights and responsibilities often in conflict can examine them as a series of questions that might be raised from both sides of the relationship. So this is something that as a medical assistant, you, like I have said again and again, you are in, you have rights, but you have to work for the physician and for the patient. So you're kind of like the liaison, like we talked about in chapter one, as an MA, you're a liaison between the physician and the patient. Um, so is it abandonment of the patient or a proper refusal of care? So as a medical professional, physicians have the right to terminate a contract with a patient or patients have the right to terminate a contract with a physician. But for a physician to terminate the contract with a patient, there's some things that have to be done first. So either you have mutual consent from the patient and the doctor, you both say, yep, I'm done coming here. I don't need to see you. I don't want to see you, et cetera. Or the patient says, no, I don't want to come to you anymore. That's fine. Or, you know, they don't need you anymore. If it's an orthopedic surgeon and your leg is healed, you don't need to see the orthopedic surgeon anymore. That's a dismissal um, also. Or, but if the doctor wants to withdraw from the relationship with a writ, with written notice, they have to do a couple different things. So they have to mail the patient a letter via certified mail um, that states that I, as of this date, I am terminating my contract with you. I'm no longer going to be your physician due to this reason. I give you 30 days from this date to find a new physician to replace me with. And in those 30 days, I will still maintain care for you on an as needed basis. Physicians can't just drop patients like hot tamales. They have to offer them 30 days to find a new physician. And also they should probably go an extra step and say, I'm gonna give you 30 days but here's a list of physicians that I think you should try calling, see if you can get in with any of them. Um, so when providers are compelled to provide care, uh, it, there's a couple different reasons that a provider would be responsible to give care. So when the patient is disabled with HIV, um, the physician has to care for them. When the patient has sued the provider group for malpractice and there's not been enough time to notify the patient to seek a new doctor, then the physician has to continue care for that patient. You can't dismiss a disabled patient with HIV. You can't refuse to see a patient who has sued your office. Um, you have to continue seeing them until they find a new doctor. When the relationship with the patient has not been continuous, you still have to provide care. And when the abandonment could constitute a criminal act, again, your, your provider is still responsible to provide that patient with care until they find a new physician. So the patient always has a right to expect his or her communications with his or her provider to be confidential. HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, is there to protect patients' information. The doctor or physician, whomever is required by statutes in most states to report child abuse and elder abuse, 
So this is where the mandated reporter comes into effect. So as a medical assistant, you are a mandated reporter. As a physician, you are a mandated reporter. As a nurse, you're a mandated reporter. What does that mean? That means that if your physician, yourself, or the office nurse or whomever suspects abuse of a child or elderly person or anyone, they're required to notify the authorities immediately, even if it's just a suspicion. The courts will protect you for abiding, for doing what you're supposed to do for abiding by the law and notifying um, that that you have a suspicion of abuse. Because, yes, people do get upset if there's a suspicion of abuse and maybe there was no abuse and then they sue you. And then the, so the court will protect the provider um, because they did what was legally obligated of them. It's called being a mandated reporter. So different types of abuse. There's elder abuse, physical abuse. Um, elder abuse is any abuse or neglect of a person age 60 and older by a caregiver or another person in a relationship involving an expectation of trust. Physical abuse is the use of physical force that may result in bodily injury, physical pain, or impairment. Neglect and exploitation. So neglect, again, is the failure or refusal of a caregiver or other responsible person to provide for an elder's basic physical, emotional, or social needs or failure to protect them from harm. And then there's exploitation, which is the unauthorized or improper use of the resources of an elder for monetary gain, um, personal benefit, profit, etc. So basically to give you kind of like a nutshell, if you're an, a home health care nurse and you're taking care of an elderly person and you hit them, that's abuse. Um, if you don't give them their medication, uh, that's neglect. If you steal their checkbook and pay your electric bill, that's exploitation, just to kind of give you an idea. The Patient Self-Determination Act requires that any healthcare provider accepting Medicare or Medicaid has to inform the patient of his or her right to accept or refuse treatment, his or her rights regarding advanced directives under the state law, and any hospital or provider policies regarding withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining equipment, like DNRs, do not resuscitate orders, etc. This is an act that protects patients if they have Medicare or Medicaid, they have to be notified because those are government agencies, government authorities. Um, it also is required that the provider ask the patient about any advanced directives, power of attorney, and living wills. The way places get around this without having to know about Medicare, Medicaid, versus, vice versa, um, is they just ask everybody these questions. It's to protect themselves and to protect the facility. Um, but it's definitely important that we make sure we ask the patients that have Medicare and Medicaid um, do they have power of attorney? Do they have a living will? What are their advanced directives? Do they have a DNR, et cetera? So medical records are like the lifeline of a medical facility. It is a collection of information about the patient and it requires careful maintenance. It's critically important. The patient care is if it's referred to another provider that has to be documented. If it's required by licensing authorities has to be documented. Um, docu it has to be documented which standard of care is substantiated, et cetera. Pardon me. Okay, so medical records also, providers and hospitals own the records that they create. So if you go to a hospital and you get seen in an emergency room, and then you go to the medical records department to get your records, and you get upset because they're not willing to give you the whole chart or what have you, you don't own your own medical records. That is not that is not the case. So you can say, oh, well, that's mine. That's about me. Like, I own that. No, you don't. The physician's office are the ones that own that. Um, the physician, if you go to a private office, the physician is the one that owns your records. Um, if you go to a hospital, the hospital is the one that owns your records. Physicians, providers, et cetera, are ethically obligated to forward the record to another person who assumes responsibility for the care of the patient. So if you've been dismissed from an office, like we talked about earlier, um, that physician has to send your record, your entire record over to your new practitioner. A court can order the records to be produced in a wide variety of circumstances using a subpoena. Electronic medical records are the new format that we use for documenting patient care. These are patient records in a digital format. Electronic health records refer to the interoperability of electronic medical records for the use, or I'm sorry, for the ability to share 
medical records with other healthcare facilities. This improves patient care coordination and reduces errors significantly. So the use of electronic records um, is, is there was a whole process um, when this first came out and it became mandatory for physicians to use the digital electronic records. Um, basically, the government came out and said, we're going to give you X amount of if you meet this deadline and you get these systems in place, um, which was the meaningful use incentive. So basically, they said, we're going to give you uh, $1,500 if by November 5th, you have implemented a new electronic health record system and are using it adequately. Um, so provided to physicians and ambulatory medical facilities that use electronic health records when they demonstrate they are meaningful use users um, of a an ID, of certified EHR system, that's kind of what that was. It was an incentive. It was like, hey, we're going to give you this, um, but you have to give me this in, in advance or in exchange. Um, so... Switching gears again, something that's really, really important and something that you have to take with you into industry, no matter what, which avenue you follow, never alter a medical record. You are working on a chart, you um, enter the wrong information. On a paper chart, you cannot white out, erase nothing. It has to be as follows. You have to draw a line through it, you have to initial the error, you have to write error above it, put the date, and then you have to put the correction below. You never want to erase or remove information from a record. These are legal documents, and if they've been altered, it could be uh, that's a it could be a really serious problem. Records should never be altered or amended in any way unless it is necessary to make the record more accurate or more complete. Again, do not um, erase. You can cross out and then amend, but you cannot erase. If a change is appropriate, the time and date of the change should be noted along with the language specifically pointing out the change. This is really important in this um, in class. I will demonstrate physically how I want you to do this in a chart. So adding an addendum um, displays at the end of the original progress note and it help tracks updates or helps to track updates made to the note and it can be added to both a signed or unsigned electronic progress note to accommodate any workflow practice um, that your practice follows. When we get into MOS and your MindTap activities, you'll get to know the EHR system and kind of the unsigned, signed, and then a excuse me, addendum process. So confidentiality and the release of the medical records is where I'm going to stop for today. That will be in part two's lecture. Just a heads up, it's a big part. Um, we talk a lot about HIPAA throughout the entire two years that you're with me, but just um, to kind of give you a brief overview, I also have a separate HIPAA presentation that we'll be doing. Um, so stay tuned. I hope that you learned a lot from this lecture. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Thanks.